Kids, get ready for story time. Good morning, everybody, and uh, good morning especially to the younger members of the congregation. I'm so excited to be with you today and to have a story time uh, during our worship service for you. Um, I, I have two grandsons uh, down in Nashville that live down in Nashville. Uh, the oldest is Henry. He's about six. He's in kindergarten this year. And the youngest is Wally. He's four, and he's actually in pre-K uh, this fall. And most of their school they're doing uh, online, like many of you are. Uh, but um, um, sometime, in the, hopefully in the near future, they're going to be back at the school building. But, you know, I, I love reading stories to them. And one of their favorite storybooks I found out uh, when Jane and I went down and visited them in Nashville was called the Jesus Storybook Bible. And what it is, is it's stories written based on Bible stories. And so I want to share one with you today. I'm talking to the big kids today about living with Jesus as Savior. Um, he's the Savior of our lives. And, and what I'm going to do is share a story with you that's all about why he became the Savior. And it's called God's Wonderful Surprise. Here's how the story goes. Jesus' friends were sad. They would never see their best friend Again, Now, this was the first Easter weekend, okay? How could this happen? Wasn't Jesus the rescuer? The king God had promised? It wasn't supposed to end like this. Yes, but whoever said anything about the end? Just before sunrise on the third day, God sent an earthquake and an angel from heaven. When the guards saw the angel, they fell down with fright. The angel rolled the huge stone away and sat on top of it and waited. At the first glimmer of dawn, Mary Magdalene and other women headed to the tomb to wash Jesus' body. The early morning sun slanted through the ancient olive trees, drops of dew glittering on leaves and grasses, little tears everywhere. The friends walked quietly along the hilly path uh, through the olive groves, until they reached the tomb. And immediately they noticed something odd. The tomb was wide open. They peered through the opening into the dark tomb. But wait, Jesus' body was gone. And something else, a shining man was there with clothes made from lightning. Don't be scared, the angel said. But they couldn't help it. They screamed anyway. The angel asked them, what are you doing here? This is a tomb and tombs are for dead people. Well, the women couldn't speak. 
Jesus isn't dead anymore, the angel said. He's alive again. And their hearts leapt. And then the angel laughed with such gladness that they felt for a moment as if they had woken up from a nightmare. The other women rushed home, but Mary stayed behind. How could it be true? Jesus was definitely dead. How could he be alive? Just then, Mary heard someone else in the garden. Perhaps it's the gardener, she thought. He'll know where Jesus' body is. I don't know where Jesus is, Mary said urgently. I can't find him. But it was all right. Jesus knew where she was, and he had found her. Mary, only one person, said her name like that. She could hear her heart thumping. She turned around. She could just make out a figure. She shaded her eyes to see and thought she was dreaming. But she wasn't dreaming. She was seeing. Jesus! Mary fell to the ground. Suddenly tears filled her eyes and great sobs shook her whole body. And all she wanted in that moment was to cling to Jesus and never let him go. You'll be able to hold on to me later, Mary, Jesus said gently, and always be close to me. But now, go and tell the others that I am alive. Mary ran and ran all the way to the city. She had never run so fast or so far in all her life. She felt she could have run forever. She didn't even feel like her feet touched the ground. The sun seemed to be dancing and gleaming and bounding across the sky, racing with her and shining brighter than she could ever remember in the clear, fresh air. And it seemed to her that morning, as she ran, almost as if the whole world had been made anew, almost as if the whole world was singing for joy, the trees, tiny sounds in the grass, the birds, her heart. Was God really making everything sad come untrue? Was he making even death come untrue? She couldn't wait to tell Jesus' friends. They won't believe it, she laughed. And she was right, of course. This was God's great surprise. Jesus was no longer dead. He rose from the dead, and it was a gift not only to those disciples and to Mary on that day, but it was also a gift to us. Thank you for joining me for story time today. God bless.
Good morning to all. Um, welcome to uh, worship here uh, online um, for Trinity United Methodist Church. Uh, we are uh, actually on our third week of the Creed worship series, continuing to ask the question, what do I believe? And today we get into the second line of the Apostles' Creed. We're using both Scripture and the Apostles' Creed to kind of lead us through what it is that we believe. And uh, the second line reads, I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. For those of you who know the Apostles' Creed, you know that line very, very well. Folks, as we get into this message, um, we're going to cover a couple of theological ideas as we get into it that will, that will help us understand better what it means to live with Jesus as our Savior. In John 1, 41, it says this, that Andrew went to find his brother Simon and told him, we have found the Messiah. So what does that word mean? Uh, speaking of theological terms and so forth, this is one. Um, in Scripture, actually, there are two favorite terms for Jesus. One is Savior and one is Lord. I mean, those are the two we hear most often. Um, you've seen in the Apostles' Creed that Jesus is described as God's what? Only Son, our Lord. Well, the word Christos, if you know a little bit of Greek, the word Christos is the Greek word for Lord, and it, and it means more than just Lord. It means divine Lord or supreme ruler or divine ruler along those lines. Um, now, in the days of the early church, the common way to describe Caesar, who was in charge of everything, the emperor, was actually Lord. So the early church wanted to change some of the lingo they were using to describe Jesus and settled on Jesus Christ or Jesus Christos. Christos, meaning Jesus the Savior or Jesus the Messiah. That's really what it means. Uh, Messiah, of course, is the Hebrew equivalent of the Greek Christos. Now, Caesar was human, okay? And, and the Christians knew that of that day. They knew that he was really human. So a term used for another human being just wouldn't do for Jesus. Caesar was uh, human, but the church realized Jesus was more than human. He was a Christos. He was a Messiah, a divine Savior. And so they put the title... Uh, um, some people think it's Jesus' last name, Jesus Christ, but they, they put it's a title is what it is. And so they put that title Christ after his more common name, which meant the same as Messiah, and it was a fulfillment of Hebrew scripture. So folks, for centuries, the, the early church professed that Jesus was more than a human being. He was both human and divine, as the scriptures clearly teach us. Well, as it were, in 325 A.D., uh, there was a major church council that settled this issue once and for all. Why in the world did they have to meet? Well, as you might expect, there was someone in the church who wasn't behaving themselves. That's why they have church councils. It was a guy by the name of Arius in 325 A.D., a guy by the name of Arius who led a small group um, inside the church that was teaching basically a heresy, a heretical teaching that said this, Jesus was not truly divine. He was just an inspirational human being, period. But he was fully human, and that was it. Well, if you've ever read the Da Vinci Code by uh, uh, Dan Brown, and I'm not sure how many of you have, have read that in the past, but you've probably run into some of those thoughts of Arius, because that's where many of these thoughts came from, that Jesus was only human. And of course, in the Da Vinci Code, uh, Jesus is married to Mary Magdalene, had children, and so forth. All very intriguing, but none of it true. And some of Brown's ideas may have come from an earlier work that came out of the late 70s, if you're familiar with this work called Holy Blood, Holy Grail, which espoused some of the same ideas. Now, about the only thing that Brown got correct in the Da Vinci Code was that there was indeed a meeting in 325 AD called the Council of Nicaea. The Council of Nicaea. In those days, Emperor Constantine, who was the emperor at that time, got the church leaders together in a place called Nicaea. It is in uh, modern-day Turkey, in the northwest part of Turkey. And they held a council 
uh, to talk about Arius' heretical teaching over and over again. And, and, and for centuries prior to that, Christians had believed that Jesus was fully human and fully divine. Then Arius and his followers came along and basically said no. They said no, that's not right. But the church and, and, and this council in 325 AD, all the church leaders, they said yes. Jesus was 100% human and 100% divine at the same time, which is what both Scripture and the Apostles' Creed uh, tell us. That's what they teach us. So people have wrestled folks with what to do with Jesus absolutely for centuries, and some are still wrestling with Jesus today. You see, Jesus, very controversial, right? If he is who he says he is, then that brings up some real issues for humanity with eternal consequences. What it really means is if we really face Jesus for who he is, it means I must either accept him or reject him. So folks, the question is, who is Jesus for me? Here's some of the disciples' earliest memories of Jesus. And Matty Yonke is going to share with us uh, our scripture for today. This is from the first uh, chapter of John. Uh, Matty, would you share with us, please? Thank you. Good morning, Mr. and Mrs. Drexler especially. (laughs) So, John the Baptist's disciples were with him one day, and Jesus, John's cousin, walked by. Here's what happened in that conversation from John 1, verses 35 through 41. The following day, John was again standing with two of his disciples. As Jesus walked by, John looked at him and declared, Look, there is the Lamb of God. When John's two disciples heard this, they followed Jesus. Jesus looked around and saw them following. What do you want? He asked them. They replied, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come and see, he said. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon when they went with him to the place where he was staying, and they remained with him for the rest of the day. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of these men that heard what John said and then followed Jesus. Andrew went to find his brother Simon and told him, we have found the Messiah, which means Christ. All right, thank you so much, Maddie, for reading that this morning. Appreciate it so much. So folks, what what is the scripture telling us? Well, number one, Andrew had it right in his day. He had it right. He knew whom he met. John helped him a little bit. He was a disciple of John the Baptist. He helped him a little bit, sent him to Jesus, and found out then that Jesus was the Messiah and couldn't wait to go share this with his brother Simon, otherwise known as uh, Peter. You know, today, throughout our world, there exists an undeniable fascination with Jesus. Uh, Among Christians and and non-Christians alike, they are just curious about Jesus. Folks, things like the Da Vinci Code, that book, or the movie, The Passion of the Christ, that we've been talking about, um, they didn't cause this fascination. I want you to know today, works like this are a result of this fascination. Uh, Jesus sells, right? Jesus sells, and and so um, quite a fascination with the whole world. I can't help but think, and I kind of remember this as a kid, but in the mid-60s, the Beatles' uh, John Lennon boasted, that the Beatles were, were bigger than Jesus, more popular than Jesus. And, you know, many wondered at that time if, if that wasn't true. The Beatles, folks, are still popular. I'm a music lover, so I like the Beatles' music, and, and they're still popular, but nowhere close to the universal appeal of one Jesus of Nazareth, first century carpenter's son, from a backwards town in an obscure Roman providence. For centuries, every recorded word Jesus spoke has been relentlessly analyzed. The Bible, including Jesus' words, of course, is the most printed, the most purchased, and the most read book in the entire world. No name is spoken out loud more than the name of Jesus, whether in praise, in jest, or in the curse. But Jesus' name is spoken more often than any other name. He was born into poverty, and yet all the world's chronology is linked to his birth date. 
Folks, whether you believe in him or not as your savior, it's hard to argue that this Jesus is probably the most influential and important person who has ever lived. But does Jesus matter to your life? That's where we want to go today. That's what we want to get to. And my answer, of course, is going to be a resounding yes. If he didn't, we wouldn't still be talking about him, would we? So folks, as my Savior, Jesus makes a real difference in my life in at least three important ways. And I want to share those with you today. And if, if you've got a copy of your notes handy, we've attached that, of course, to the uh, weekly update on Saturday. Uh, but uh, you can fill in the blanks. But here are the three differences that Jesus makes in my life. For my past, Jesus offers forgiveness. Probably the greatest gift this world has ever been given. The story time this morning, we talked about um, the reason we have forgiveness is because Jesus was our sacrifice on the cross, and then he, he died, and then he was resurrected on Easter morning. That's what that story is about. But Jesus offers us forgiveness for our past. Let's be honest today, okay? Most of us don't like to revisit our past all that much. For many of us, our past is filled with mistakes, decisions we've made, actions we've taken, things we've done or said, or people that we've hung out with. Mistakes. We all make them, don't we? As human beings, none of us are perfect. We constantly mess up. And the Bible's word for that is sin. Sin literally means missing the mark. And every one of us misses the mark from time to time. Now, I want you to listen to me for a moment. Listen to this, because this is so important that we grasp this. Sin or missing the mark always has consequences in our lives, like hurt or shame or regret. But the most devastating consequence of sin is this. It separates us from God. Sin separates us from God, from his presence in our lives right now. And if we're not careful, eventually from our eternity with him. Sin in your life serves as a barrier to God's blessings and God's healings and God's very presence in your life. And our response to sin, usually one of three things is how we respond to sin in our lives. One, we try to bury it. That's one way that we respond to sin. Or we try to blame others for it. That's number two. That's the second way that we try to deal with sin. And number three is this. We beat ourselves up over it, don't we? If we've done something wrong, we beat ourselves up over it. But none of these things are helpful at all. Folks, the only real escape from the consequences of sin comes in the forgiveness that God offers us through Jesus Christ. Acts chapter 13 and beginning with 30, verse 38 uh, shares this with us where it says, Brothers and sisters, listen, we are here to proclaim that through this man Jesus, there is forgiveness for your sins. Everyone who believes in him is made right in God's sight, something the law of Moses could never do, could never do. Folks, there is no way you can free yourself from the consequences of sin, not even by living a good life or being a good person. One of my favorite people in this whole world is a man by the name of Dale Douglas. He was Jane's earthly father, my father-in-law. He was more like a second dad to me, though. I loved him, and I respected him. And as a headstrong young man, he was one of the few people that I would listen to. And the bottom line was, he, he was one of the finest human beings I have ever met in my life. Well, long story short, he, he knew when Jane and I picked up in Wisconsin and moved everyone to Kentucky to go back to school that something was up. He knew that my father had been a pastor, but had no idea that one of his daughters would eventually be married to a pastor my mother-in-law was a, a Christian woman. She was a church-going Christian all her life. So he had that example to look to, and he respected my mother-in-law, Phyllis, very, very much. 
but because of an unfortunate incident that took place actually in a Methodist church when he was a kid. In general, he would not have anything to do with the church or with God for most of his life. But we kept praying for him through the years. Not too long before the summer that we moved here to Lamira, my in-laws finally had to move out of their own home and into an assisted living facility. I guess it was then that Dale probably began to explore his own faith. We, we know when we're getting into our winter years. We just know in our heart of hearts when we're getting towards the end of our life. And, and so he began to explore his faith. He began to go to church with my mother-in-law from time to time. And folks, he finally, I believe this, he finally gave his life to the Jesus who forgives. And he was baptized, as Jesus tells us to be. I'm telling you right now, if anyone could have dealt with the consequences of sin in their life by being a good person, it would have been Dale Douglas. He was incredible. He was the kind of guy, the kind of neighbor, and the kind of friend who literally would have given you the shirt off his own back if you needed it. But even he couldn't deal with the fallen nature of humanity on his own. He needed Jesus, and he finally accepted Jesus' gift of forgiveness, becoming a child of the Father in the process. John chapter 1 and verse 9 says this, but if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness in anything that's not of God. Folks, Jesus forgives us instantly, and he forgives us completely. But the only solution to sin still comes from the, the righteousness that God offers us through Jesus' death on the cross. And so for my past, Jesus offers forgiveness. So I'll be ready both for this life and for what's next. For my past, Jesus offers this gift that I do not deserve. Relevant? Is Jesus important in my life? I think so. I think so. And then for my present, for my present, Jesus offers significance. Significance. Folks, have you ever had the thought that you really wanted your life to count for something? Has that thought ever crossed your mind? Or are you satisfied with, with keeping life in neutral, not really caring about reaching a specific destination at all? That's kind of a dangerous way to live, isn't it? Throughout the ages, philosophers have uh, theorized and average people have wondered if there isn't more to life than just living. There must be a greater plan to life. There must be a purpose behind it all. Perhaps the most famous philosophical treatment of this in, in, in years or the timeline, it was just prior to Jesus, is the allegory of the cave by Plato. Now, if you've ever, if you were in Philosophy 101 in college, you probably know this because this probably story probably came up, uh, this uh, particular allegory. But Plato, long story short, and here's kind of a sketch behind me. Uh, kind of a sketch of, of uh, what Plato imagined, but Plato imagined people lived in caves and always saw shadows going back and forth because of the fire that was in the cave. But, but things really were kind of in black and white. And, and, the, and the people realized uh, who lived there that there must be more outside of that cave. One day, someone escapes. This is how the story goes, the allegory. Well, someone escapes from the cave and they make it out of that cave and into the light. And they see different colors and a richness like they've never seen before and a fullness of life that they never knew existed. And then they come back to the cave to tell the others about the new life they'd found, only to find that what they had to share was rejected. It was refused and the ideas were eventually put to death. Plato went on to say at the end of this allegory that what it's like outside the cave, he really does not know. But he's pretty sure there's a greater life 
in the light, there has to be a difference between existing and really living. There has to be a difference. Folks, I'm here to tell you today that when Jesus came, he spoke about different levels of living. He had the audacity to say that that he's the door that leads to this higher plane of existence. He said people have lived in the dark all of their lives, but he was there to show them the light. There is a difference between existing and really living, between survival and real significance in life. In John chapter 10 and verse 10, we read this, Jesus' words. He said the thief's purpose, he's talking about the enemy, the devil, is to steal and kill and destroy. But he said, my purpose, my purpose for coming, my purpose for being your savior is to give them a rich and satisfying life. In other words, folks, Jesus is the one who came to offer our lives significance for the present, significance for today. So for our present life, we can know this significance. And I can't help but think of another Bible story too in Acts chapter 16 and verse 30 when when Paul and Silas were were thrown in prison and, and they were singing, of course, in prison and they were worshiping while they were in prison and they really had an impact on the lives of others who were there, including those who worked there. And the jailer who was watching after them in this story, the one who would eventually lead them out of the jail, He asked them, Paul and Silas, he said, sirs, he said, what must I do to be saved? In other words, what must I do to really live, to know life like you know it? That's the essence of this conversation. He saw in Paul and Silas a life that had been changed from the inside out. They'd found significance because of the presence of God in their lives. And God, folks, is still changing lives today. He's still offering his significance to us and to our lives. And so our present, can, present, uh, present time here can be filled with this kind of significance. And then finally, for my future. For my future, Jesus offers the magic word here, the fill in the blank, is assurance. For us Wesleyans, it has to be assurance. Many people have approached me over the years with a simple question, how can I know that I'm saved? You know, I I hear the stories about Jesus, but how can I know that I'm saved? Folks, the challenge, and I'm telling you, a lot of walls get built up in this life that that kind of challenge this this thinking and and that we are children of God will challenge us on that. And one of those is the challenge of adversity, which all of us are going through just a bit right now. These are not easy days. These are hard days or, or the temptation to sin. Any low point in our spiritual walk can cause us to doubt our identity as a child of God, that God is in indeed our Father. So whatever it may be, I just want you to know, though, that doubting your personal salvation is not a unique experience. I say anybody who goes through a spiritual experience, will go through this from time to time. Before his Aldersgate experience in 1738, Mr. John Wesley, who was an Anglican priest at the time, a priest in the Church of England, he writes that, that having an assurance of his identity as a child of God was really missing in his life. He didn't know what that meant. According to his own description of his spiritual journey, and and John Wesley, if you know him, he wrote down everything. It's very likely that before this evangelical conversion on Aldersgate Street in London, Wesley was probably not a born-again Christian. Now listen to me. He was an Anglican priest, but not a Christian. Think about that. And then he writes this of his very personal Aldersgate experience. And actually what was happening on Aldersgate Street, he was attending a Bible study. And as he was attending that Bible study on Aldersgate Street in London, uh, somebody was reading from a, a commentary from the Bible, and it was Martin Luther's commentary. His preface to his commentary on Romans was read. And I've read it, and I'm not that excited about it, so I don't know what happened, but somehow God spoke to him through that at that moment. 
and spoke to his heart. And here's what he said. He said, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I did trust in Christ, Christ alone for my salvation. And an assurance, there's that assurance, was given me that he had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. Folks, that is the founder of Methodism who went through this spiritual journey and found out that maybe he didn't have this gift of assurance. Maybe he wasn't really a child of God. But we can know. Folks, this is putting it mildly, but John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, he was a real mess before Aldersgate. He was preaching a faith that he did not yet personally know. He was preaching about a Jesus that he did not personally know. But here at Aldersgate, London, he had an experience of assurance of his salvation. In Wesleyans today, that's you and me, if we're part of the Methodist movement, Wesleyans call that a doctrine of assurance, that we can know that we are children of God. But folks, this is the gift that Jesus offers us for the days ahead. We can know that we know that we know. We can know that we know that we know that we are a child of God. Jesus has our sins covered. We are forgiven. Our lives are significant, and we can rest assured that all is well when it comes to our future. One of the scriptures that really affected John Wesley strongly was from Romans chapter 8 and verse 16, and I'd like to share that with you today from the version of the Bible called The Message. I just love the way it reads. This was a help to Wesley. Maybe it'll be a help to you too. It reads this way, God's Spirit touches our spirits and confirms who we really are. We know who he is, and we know who we are, father and children. And we know we are going to get what's coming to us, an unbelievable inheritance. Folks, there may be moments when a difficult situation will remove from your life any sense of personal assurance. Maybe lapses into sin will lead to doubt. Nonetheless, I want to say this today. Relationships and being a child of God is just that. It's a relationship. They are not broken off instantly. The same God who gracefully justifies us also preserves us in our weakness. The merit of our identity as God's children with Jesus as our Savior is not based on our subjective knowledge, but on the work of Christ and his spirit in our lives. Assurance is nothing other than a gift, an incredible, merciful gift from God to his children. So does Jesus matter to your life? My answer is still yes, absolutely. Living with Jesus as Savior means that I have his forgiveness for my past. I have his significance for my present, that my life is significant. It's going to count for something eternally. And also I have his assurance that I am his kid. I am his kid. I have that assurance for my future. Folks, do I even need to ask, does it get any better than that? That's where we're going to stop today. Next week, we'll dig into what it means to live with the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. Don't miss that one as we continue to unravel, to unfold what it means to be a Christian, a Christ follower today. Would you pray with me? Gracious God, I just thank you so much for this day, and I thank you for your word to us today. Jesus is our Savior. What a great, great gift to our lives, the greatest gift to our lives. Lord, I just want to stop as we close this time and give you thanks today. With thankful hearts, we come before you and we say thank you, Lord God, for your forgiveness in our lives. Without Jesus and what he did on that cross, giving of his life, that sacrifice, the carrying of our sins, and the covering of our sins, we wouldn't have a chance. So thank you for that forgiveness. Thank you also for... um, the significance that you will lend to our lives because 
Your mission becomes our mission when we give our lives to you. So thank you for the significance that our lives can have eternally. And thank you also, Lord God, for the incredible gift of assurance. I thank you for John Wesley and for his witness to us that, that he, even he, could have his sins forgiven and he could be assured that he is a child of yours. Lord God, give us that assurance today. If any of us doubts today, help us to leave here today knowing that we can know, that we can know, that we can know, that we are children of yours. Thank you, Lord God, for this incredible word to us today. Bless us as we go into this week. Help us to remember what we've seen and heard and experienced in this place. And Lord God, prepare our hearts for next week. We pray all this today in Jesus' name.